So uh, the next session is on active value investing, investing in a market that goes nowhere. This session is to be moderated by Mr. Ajay Tyagi, head of equities at UTI Asset Management. And, and to spread some more light on this topic, we have Vitali Katzen-Elson. To give a brief background of, of uh, Mr. Ajay Tyagi, he's the head of equities at UTI Asset Management. He's a CFA charter holder from the in CFA Institute and holds a master's degree in finance from Delhi University. Ajay joined UTI in the year 2000 and he has been having, he has carried out successful roles across and responsibilities across research, offshore funds, as well as domestic funds. He's won many accolades and awards for his portfolio performances, both domestically and globally. Ajay presently manages the flagship equity scheme for UTI and is also the investment advisor to UTI International's offshore funds. Uh, with that, I would request Ajay to come over on stage and, and take it from here for the next session. Good morning, uh, everyone. Let me introduce our distinguished speaker for this session, Vitaly Ketsinilson, who was born in Murmansk, USSR, and migrated to the US uh, post the Soviet Union uh, in a way collapse. Uh, he joined the value investment firm in Denver in 1997, became its Chief Investment Officer in 2007 and the CEO of that firm in 2012. He's a prolific writer. He has won some awards for the books that he has written. He's also known for his uncommon common sense, uh, for which Forbes magazine has called him as the new Benjamin Graham. Uh, he's written publications. He's written for publications including the Financial Times, Barron's, Institutional Investor, and also on foreign policy. His articles are also published on his website, The Contrarian Edge, and in audio format on his Intellectual Investor podcast. Vittori lives in Denver with his wife and three kids. In fact, one of his daughters is joining us uh, today for this session. And he loves to read, loves to uh, listen to Western classical music, plays chess, and writes about uh, life, investing, and music. In fact, he's recently written a book called Soul in the Game, which is his first non-investing book. So, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Vitaly. Thank you very much, Adi. Thank you for a very kind introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. I apologize. I'm, uh, I have a small cold. So kind of losing my voice, so I'll be drinking a lot of hot tea. I promise you, this is not Johnny Walker, this is <laughs> tea. So, um, anyway, so I'll be, you know, fighting through that. Uh, sure. Really, I must start by asking you this question that you've actually been touring India over the last one week. You know, most of us uh, here in this audience are extremely proud about the India growth story. I mean, that's what we keep telling uh, to all overseas investors, we keep telling to our Indian investors. Was the India growth story palpable to you in the last one week? Yes, but let me, no, but I- That was a very tentative no, yes. No, no, so it's, let, me, let me, what, I have a lot of Indian friends in the United States, and I was still blown away by Indian people, I, which is the biggest asset of this country by far. Russia's asset is the oil and whatever else. India's asset is they just, it's wonderful people. And um, the reason I have this hesitation and this yes is because I think India desperately needs infrastructure. For India to be able to compete with China, and I think that's really what India is gonna try to do. It really needs infrastructure to you know, because um, we, you know, we drove from Jodhapur to Udapur, Udapur yeah. which is you know, maybe 100 something miles. It took us seven hours. Right. And, uh, and now imagine, imagine uh, uh, 
uh, now I mentioned if you are uh, trying to transport microchips, etc., you know, there's different things. So you need much better infrastructure. I think that's probably, that's, if you overcome that, and I think you will at some point, then, you know, then the, you know, the future will be, you know, much brighter. So that's kind of yeah. sitting back in my mind. I think, I think this is a point where most of us would agree with you. We desperately need more infrastructure to support our consumption boom. Uh, let me get back to uh, the first book that you wrote. Uh, at least that's the first book that I read, uh, uh, you know, which uh, was authored by you, which was the little book on the sideways market. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, some people believe that the sideways market is already arriving. We've seen uh, the last decade of a huge uh, boom in equity markets, especially in the US, some other markets as well. So first of all, how do we judge a sideways market? What are the signs of a sideways market? And, and why is it relevant for an audience like us? All right, okay. So to have this, this discussion, I have to give you some stock market math, a little bit. So if you try to understand what's gonna happen in the stock market, you need to understand where the returns from for stocks come from. And they come from two sources. So the stock prices go up for two reasons in the long run. Just, that's two reasons. Earnings growth and price to earnings either compression or expansion. So, in the, if the price to earnings stayed at the same level, which is about 15 times average, you know, then you would have no market cycles because you would basically make about 6% a year. That's what GDP growth is in the long run. And earnings growth and GDP growth for the stock market has been about the same. So in other words, if price to earnings doesn't change, then you would make 6% a year plus dividends, which is another 4 or 5%. Okay, however, what happened historically is that price to earnings, by the way, is the microphone fine or just? Yeah, yeah, I think you're audible. It's fine, all right. So price to earnings went from below average level to above average level. So when they were low, they went through average and went to high. That journey created secular bull market, which lasted 15, 20 years. Right. Now, when you get to the high level, price to earnings mean revert. They go from above average through average to below average. Then this is when you have a sideways market. So what will basically happen, just think about this. If stock markets, if um, in over the last 100 years, your stock market produced about 11% a year. Mm -hmm. During the bull market phase, let's say it produced 18. Right. And then during the sideways market phase, it produced three or four, which basically comes from dividends. So, price, so the way the sideways, sideways market looks like is just a lot of volatility, you have a lot of bull and bear markets inside of it, and the market is going nowhere. Now, let's talk about today's market. Today, the, well, and so the, this is a very important point. Sideways markets always happen at the end of bull markets when price turnings are high. Right. Now, today valuations are very high. How, how, why do I say they're high? Let's just go through this very simple map. S&P is trading about, let's say, 4,000, roughly. I think it's 3,800. Uh, this year, Expecting the, uh, it's expected to make about 200, uh, 200 hours of earnings. So let's say it's a trade about 19, 20 times earnings, roughly. Now, that in itself is not a very high number, but, and this is a very important point, I think one of the speakers before me talked about it a little bit. Um, today, corporate profit margins are at all-time high. And when I say all-time high, the highest level ever. Right. Okay? Now, over the last 15, 20 years, Corporate profit margins benefited from three trends. Globalization, low interest rates, and declining tax rates in the United States, corporate tax rates. Now, interest rates no longer declining. Globalization is going the other way now. It's, you know, and uh, corporate tax rates most likely to go up. So if profit margins now, anyway, so where was I? So the, you're talking about the corporate yeah, so the, profits so, so, uh, and so, the margins. So, the, so profit margins today at about 11.5%. If they go down, if they go back to the stock averages, earnings will not be 200, but will be either 100 or 130 or 150. So suddenly stocks are not trading at 19 times earnings, but trading at 30 times earnings or 40 times earnings. So this is why I think it's very likely. My book, The Little Book of Cyber Markets, is actually more even relevant today than when I, when I wrote it because Valuations are very high, and most likely for the next 10, 15, maybe 20 years, I don't know, the returns for your stock market are going to be very, very poor. 
or negative, or even negative. Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, should investors like us be worried about the sideways market? I mean, how do we make money in a sideways market? Well, what you don't do, how, how's the microphone doing? All right, all right. Well, what you don't do is you don't buy index funds. Mm -hmm. Because if you're, if you're buy, basically buying index funds, you're buying a stock market that's very expensive. The strategy that has worked historically in this environment is actually value investing. Right. And I know you want to talk about this, Salim. I'm going to jump forward a little bit. So what is value investing? Let me tell you what it's not. Okay. So most people think of value investing as buying statistically cheap stocks. If you can count to 10, you're a value investor, basically. right? So if you're buying a stock at eight times earnings, you're a value investor. That's not what value investing is. Value investing is, I look at it as almost like a philosophy. Um, this country has 330 million gods, right? So this is like, you know, like you know, <laughs> a lot of temples. So this, that's a, I look at it as a philosophy or kind of a little religion, if you like. That has six commandments, six. Okay, number one, you look at stocks not as pieces of paper, as businesses. You invest for the long run. Right. Okay, stock market is there to serve you, not the other way around. Um, the, you always look for margin of safety because the future, in other words, you want to buy something that's worth a dollar for less because predicting this future is difficult and you need, uh, you need margin of safety. And there's probably a few more uh, commandments, but this is basically what value investment is. So in this environment, I think the strategy that works is kind of value investment strategy. Also, you have to be very careful. Um, because in the past, um, if you used relative valuation, it worked beautifully. Uh, today, uh, in the sideways market, it's going to hurt you a lot. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say um, you look at a company, it's trading at 40 times earnings. I'm just making this up just to make sure. sure. Okay? And you say, well, it used to trade at 65 times, so therefore it's cheap. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens in the in this, the valuations, the price earnings you're going to observe in the future are going to be very different than the one you observed during the bull market phase. Therefore, if you do relative valuation analysis, it's going to lead you into um, what I call relative valuation trap. So you want to be very careful. So when you buy companies, you want to make sure that they actually undervalued based on their cash flows. Mm -hmm. so, the, the, so you've got to make this kind of modifications. Also, another one is you need to become a an active uh, uh, seller as well. So when a company becomes fully valued, you don't hope that it becomes overvalued, you just right. sell it. Okay, that's the, you know. Sure. So I think two takeaways from what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong. One, we shouldn't be afraid of a sideways market, but because perhaps the coming decade would be the decade of the active investor rather than a passive investor. Absolutely. Uh, which is good news for most of us, because most of us have struggled beating the benchmarks in the last uh, decade or so. And the second one, you're saying that value investing isn't really about cheapness. It's, it really isn't about buying something which is very low on price earnings, price to book value, but basically buying something which is worth a dollar, but buying it for, let's say, 70 cents. That's right. Which basically means that you could have many of these high growth names, which could be trading at statistically high multiples, but still have uh, uh, value in them and would have a price which is lower than the value at which they are trading. Sure. Uh, let's move on and, uh, you know, uh, the next question I have is for your, uh, on your latest book, Soul in the Game. Can you just set the context about this book and then I'll maybe, uh, you know, talk you through some of the important things that I found in the book. Um, all right, so the, yes, yeah, so my first two books were about investing. My third book is called Soul in the Game and by the way, is yeah, I just found out yesterday, it's been uh, published in uh, Mumbai, so it's, it's going to be in the translate to Marathi. So I'm very it's been published in Marathi, by the way. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Uh, so I'm very proud of that. Um, okay, so this book is the book about life. And I talk about different topics. I talk about growing up in Russia. I talk about parenting, classical music, stoic philosophy, creativity. And usually you don't expect a finance guy to write this kind of book. And, and the kind of natural question comes, what does, you know, why investment guy writes a book, like, a book like this. My answer is, um, there was a very famous senior who was actually from India, Freddie Mercury. Mm -hmm. And he has this uh, line, there must be more to life than this. Mm -hmm. 
there's a lot more to life than just to write about investing. So that's why I wrote this book. Right. Um, and so that's, that's it. That's, that's sure. You know, one of the most important uh, sections in that book is your stoic philosophy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, why is it important? I mean, I thought that being a stoic is, is important for an investor. I think we've all grown up reading Warren Buffett newsletters. And I think uh, when I was younger, I couldn't appreciate when he used to say that this business is more about your emotional quotient, not as much about your uh, uh, IQ. So uh, in a way, I thought when you spoke about stoic philosophy, it was about accepting things as they are and still moving on. So can you just tell us more about stoic philosophy and how do we connect that back into investments? Okay, so, this, um, so stoic philosophy, uh, so, let's, so when you have these two words together, they're a little bit intimidating. Philosophy is just, all it means is love of wisdom. That's all it is. So it's a, um, and stoic philosophy is a philosophy that came from ancient Greece about 2,000 years ago. And there are basically three stoics uh, which philosophy is built on. Uh, Epictetus, who was a slave, uh, Marcus Aurelius, he was the emperor of Rome, and uh, Seneca, who was kind of the, the Renaissance man before, you know, 15 centuries before Renaissance. You know, he, he, he was a playwright, he was a senator, he was an investment banker, many different things. And when I read Stoic philosophy, I was blown away by this. Why? Here's why. Um, we, it's, the way I look at it, it's an operating system for life. So what happens when we are born, like we come with hardware and very little software. Like, uh, and as we, as, kind of, as we age, our operating system is, is written by a lot of random factors, by our parents, by our friends, by circumstances, by books we read. And our operating system, kind of the way we approach life, is kind of a hodgepodge of, diff of our different experiences. What stoic philosophy did for me, it kind of gave me a framework through which to look at life. And one of the most important frameworks, and that's the one you were alluding to, is uh, the dichotomy of control. Uh, and, it, it, and as you will see, it applies to investing as well. Um, the Epictetus basically said there are some things that are up to us, some things aren't. Mm -hmm. I know that's not earth shattering, okay? But then he defines what is up to us. Up to us is basically is our behavior, okay? Uh, how we react to things. Everything else is not up to us. When you drive to work and there's are green lights, you hit green lights, it's not up to you that you know, there are green lights, I mean, the red lights. What's up to you how to, you, you, you react to that? Your wife is not kind, well, your wife or husband is not happy with you, it's not up to you, okay? What's up to you is how you react uh, to your spouse's behavior. And so once you start looking through life this way, it's actually, you find a lot of peace of mind in this, okay? Because you realize you really just want to control the controllables, right. okay? And the, the only controllable you have is, is your word, your behavior, this kind of things. So now let's take it from stoic philosophy and bring it to investing. As investors, when we buy a company, it's not really up to us what happens to the stock after, after we bought it, okay? What's up to us is our research process, our analysis. What's up to us is our reaction to the news. Have you been rational or not rational? And um, um, I'm gonna deviate a little bit, and I wanna talk about EQ and IQ, right. okay? because I think this is a very important concept. So when, when we buy companies, we always ask ourselves a question. When we, when, we, when we look at this company, what is our IQ? when it comes to this business, how well we understand the business, but also what is my EQ when it comes to the business? And our EQ is gonna be, our IQ when it comes to business and EQ is gonna be different from company to company. I'll give you an example. I have a friend who is a brilliant money manager and one of his first investments, he lost money on a grocery store. And a while back I was talking to him about it, he said don't talk to me about grocery stores because I lost money my EQ is going to be very low, mm -hmm. okay? So this, this is the person who realized, so yes, he understands the business of grocery stores, but he knows when he owns it, his EQ is going to be low, and therefore, 
Now, this is a very important formula. What is your total IQ? Is your EQ times your IQ. Now, your IQ, let's say, uh, is 150, okay? But your EQ cannot be greater than one. Right. Okay, so if your EQ when it comes to grocery stores is 0.5, it means your total IQ is 75. Right. Okay, so it does matter how well you understand the business. If you're gonna buy high and sell low, then it's even- you Basically like, buy businesses where your EQ is as close to one as possible. Exactly, exactly. Which in a way means that try and basically operate in your circle of competence. You ought to be knowing things very well before investing. If you don't know things very well, then your EQ will slide less than one and you'll end up selling them at the wrong time. It's almost like you have to know two circle of competences. Your IQ circle of competence and your EQ. Sure. Okay, so, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, Whitley, I'll uh, have one last question on this topic before you move on. I mean, whatever you said makes absolute sense. Basically, you're saying that don't bother too much about the externalities. Focus on the process, focus on uh, your own research. But the problem is that this business is not just about absolute gains that we make. I think as money managers, we play a relative game where we are marked up against the benchmarks, we are marked up against our peers. So inevitably, this comparison and this relative performance creeps into the process. How do we take care of that? So I have a privilege of creating, uh, kind of creating the game I play, and uh, which it's not necessarily something that other people can do. But I run my own firm, and therefore we get to choose our clients. Mm -hmm. Okay, so having the right clients is extremely important. If your clients are going to be judging you on how you do over three or six months, you're going to be you're going to have a very miserable existence. Right. So we choose clients. So it's a, a lot of times you're just happy to get a client. Okay, we got, you know, we, we are at the point where we actually get a choice. We, we have an opportunity to choose clients we take. And when we find people who want us to produce returns in the short term, we have to let them go. So that's, so having the right clients, I think, is the, um, and the right expectation, I, you, know, sitting, you know, having the right clients, setting the right expectations. And I think it's the, the right communication. I, I, I write letters to clients four times a year, and this letter is about 30 pages long. Right. Where I basically, um, it's like, it's my own internal propaganda, okay? So after, even if we got a wrong client in the beginning, hypothetically, over time, this person reads enough of my essays and my letters, hopefully, you know, he, you know, he gets converted to our philosophy. Right, yeah. sure. So while we may not get to choose our client, but we ought to be communicating our Yes. our process and, and setting the right expectations. Yes. Uh, let me change gears and let me get more topical. I think uh, many in this audience would want to hear your views uh, on what's happening around the world right now, what's happening uh, to interest rates and inflation. Let me start by just making an observation that at least to my mind, Fed was horribly behind the curve when they kept saying that inflation is transitionary, inflation is because of certain supply chain bottlenecks, but it turned out to be sticky and as sticky as it was in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, and, and therefore, they just went on, uh, you know, this accelerated increase in interest rates. Do you, do you suspect that they are behind the curve again? Do you suspect that they are not being patient enough in terms of seeing the cumulative impact of these interest rates on growth, on unemployment? And if yes, do you suspect that we may end up into a terrible recession for which the response again would be reducing interest rates in a hurry like they've done in the past? I think I struggle with the, the way the equation is formed a little bit because that assumes that Federal Reserve is supposed to be doing this, not the market, you know, free market economy is supposed to be sending the interest rates. Um, the, I would argue that it's going to be almost impossible for us not to have high interest rates and avoid a recession for a very simple reason. When you have low interest rates for a long period of time, it changes kind of the composition of the economy and the leverage in the economy, okay? And um, I'll give you a couple uh, you know, kind of real life observations. Let's look at the housing market, US housing market. Okay, so about eight months ago, interest rates, uh, if you bought a house, you would have basically paid about 3% interest rate uh, to buy a house. Um, today, you would be paying close to 7%. Now, I want you to imagine this for a second. Average American family earns about $70,000 a year, okay? Um, 
average mortgage until about eight months ago was about $15,000 a year. Okay, uh, you're with me so far, right? Now, over the last four years, the housing prices basically went up about 30%. So the median house, housing price went up, if I remember the numbers right, went, went from 270 to three something, to 380, I forget the numbers, but went up by 30%, right? So the, when the housing prices went up by 30%, that also coincided with interest rates going from four to 3%, so therefore, the payment stayed about $15,000 a year. So that hasn't changed, okay? So far, so good. And then interest rates went from 3% to 7%. Now, the, if you were to buy a house today uh, that now is worth, you know, cost 30% more, you have to pay, you know, your, your, the cost of interest doubled. So now, if you, you were to buy this house, the cost would be about $30,000 a year. Remember, this is on the income of 75,000. So basically, the increase in interest rate priced out people out of the housing market. Now, it gets more interesting. Now, imagine this. Let's say you bought a house a while back, and all you wanted, and you borrowed the 3% interest rate. Now, you want to sell this house, and it, the house appreciated. So, you know, if you sell this house and buy a house next door, you just transfer your equity from this house to this house. So that doesn't matter. However, you'll be borrowing at 7% now, not 3%. And therefore, just moving from a house next door is gonna cost you $15,000 more a year. My, house, my, 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 my older brother is in real estate in Denver, and he has not had a single sale last six months. Right. Because the housing market is basically stopped in the United States. So now, this is just one example. Now, if you look at the car market, the same thing. The uh, average car payment is uh, just hit a new high, seven hundred eleven dollars a month. Sure. See, so, so suddenly, goods that had to be financed become unaffordable. Okay, and um, <coughs> so I think it's going to be very difficult for the U.S. economy to deal with high, you know, with high, you know, with high interest rates. And also, there is a there is a counter argument to this, and people say, well, the housing prices in the eight, like the in the eighties, interest rates were. 15 to 18 percent. If you if you're gonna if you're gonna buy a house, Except, and that's true, you know. So the interest rates today are only seven, where in the 80s they were 15 percent, you know, and that's true. Except if you look at the relationship of income to the housing price, actually the other way around, house price to income, that ratio in the 80s was about three. Mm -hmm. Now we at six. So the housing prices in relation to the income are much much higher. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, the way I look at it, I don't know what, I'm not trying to predict what Federal Reserve is going to do because nobody knows. They don't know what they're going to do. Right. But I can, I'm investing as if we are going into recession and it's going to be a long lasting recession. Do I know this 100%? Of course I don't. Sure. But in this business, all you have to do is just look at probabilities and thinking about what's the cost of being wrong. I think the cost of being wrong if you're investing as if we're going to be absolutely fine is much higher as versus as if we're going to go into recession. And it's going to be a recession that's going to last longer than the one in the past. So. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, staying on interest rates, uh, while you're absolutely right, we may get into recession at some stage, none of us know. Uh, but the fact is that uh, while all of us are consumed by high interest rates, I just went back to look at the interest rates in the 80s and the 90s. Of course, uh, we all remember Paul Volcker for taking interest rates to right up to 20%. That's on the Fed funds. Uh, and then interest rates starting to slide in the late 80s. But, you know, between the late, uh, between, I'm sorry, between the mid 80s to the late 90s, interest rates were still very, very high. And I would say much higher than what the most hawkish predictions for interest rates can be for the coming two to three years. And yet we had an economy which came out of recession, we had an economy which actually did fairly well for 15 years, and even the markets did very well. So in a sense, what I'm trying to ask is that, are we overly worried about the direction of the interest rates? Are we overly worried that high interest rates would lead to the economy being into a prolonged recession? Yes, it would be a deep recession, maybe lasting a couple of years, but I mean, shouldn't we be more indexed to finding the businesses which notwithstanding high interest rates will continue to produce like you said, those cash flows. So there's three points you're making. Let me agree with the last one first. 
So, so I agree with you with the last point. So you, I think it's, first of all, you, you have to look at businesses that can do well in a high interest rate environment, okay? And if you can find these businesses, they're usually probably gonna be non-cyclical. Most likely, their revenues will not, be, will not come from um, consumers' ability or corporate ability to borrow a lot of money, okay? If you can find those businesses, you're absolutely fine. And you can buy them cheap, so I agree with you there. Now, let me address two other points you made. Um, okay, so from 1980 to 2000, the stock market had one of the best runs in history. Right. Okay? While in 1980s, interest rates were very high, right? Well, a couple points. Number one, interest rates have declined from 80s to, uh, to, uh, to 2000. So they, they, you know, they, they started uh, 1980s at 18% and ended at 5 or 6 so interest rates have, you know, have been on a gradual decline. That's point number one. Point number two, in 1982, this is when the bull market started, the price to earnings for S&P 500 was about seven or eight. Mm -hmm. So the valuations were very different. Right. There were a couple of other differences. Today, we have, I forget the numbers now, but we had, at the, in 1980s, the debt to, to GDP in the US economy was much different. We had a lot less debt. You know, today, you know, we have a lot more debt. Um, also, uh, like as we, you know, we just talked about housing market, um, the housing prices in relation to income were very different as well. So there's a lot of differences. It doesn't mean that, uh, so I'm a stock picker, okay? So I, I, I have the luxury that I only need to buy 25 stocks. And I can look for stocks all over the, you know, all over the, uh, like in, in the U.S. and Europe, et cetera. So I just need to find 25 companies that will do well in this environment, and that's how I'm approaching it. So what I'm saying is this. If you, if you have to buy index funds, my sincere condolences to you, okay? Because you're gonna have a very difficult life. If you're a stock picker, you actually have an opportunity to create a lot of value for your clients. Right. That's, I hope I answered Sure, that. I think in a way you're reiterating the fact that the coming decade could be the decade for the stock picker, for the active investor. Yeah. So, I'm exhausted with my questions, and I think at this stage, uh, we would want to take the questions from the audience. Somebody will have to help me with this because I'm struggling with this gadget. Anybody from the organizers who can? So maybe we can ask the audience to move their hands and ask questions. Sure. We'll have to rotate the mic in that case. So can I ask the first question? Yes. Smart beta? I think, oh God, okay, so I, you know, I remember how I started this conversation that um, like value investing is a lot more than just buying statistically cheap stocks. So I'm not sure what smart beta fund means because this is outside of my pay grade. Um, but I would argue that just knowing nothing else, if you're buying, um, if you're buying uh, high PE stocks going forward versus buying low PE stocks, low PE stocks should do better in, in, in general, okay? Because there was a lot of studies done on that. Um, but I cannot say, I don't know a single thing about smart beta, you know, funds. Uh, 
Uh, so I had a quick question about the housing market, uh, because that's, that's the section which I found really interesting from what you were saying. Uh, I personally am of the view that you will get a recession, but it won't be in 23, it'll be in 24. And the recession that comes through will also be a short and shallow one. Uh, and one of the reasons why I think that's likely, and I'd love to hear your views on that would be, uh, the housing market is in not as bad a shape this time as it has been historically, whenever you know we've gone into a prolonged recession in the US. In particular, uh, the variable rates, uh, the variable rate priced loans in the US right now at a pretty low number at 35% or yeah, something yeah. like that, as compared to 60% when we had the last crisis. So the effect of higher interest rates is going to hit the, the US housing market much lesser. Number two, I also think the quality of lending that's taken place in the US this time, because everybody still remembers 2000, 2007, 2008, uh, is just much better. So, you know, that vicious cycle that usually comes through uh, may not come through. Uh, so, would love to hear your views on whether, you know, the housing market is going to be as big a drag on the U.S. economy this time around as it has been in the past. Yeah. So, that's a very good question. And I, so, and you're right, there is a supply-demand imbalance is very different now than it was uh, in 2008. So, you're absolutely right about this. What What's very, what's in you, so one point you're making that's very, very important, I think, is that you're right, I think 90% of the mortgages in the United States are fixed rate mortgage, right? So in other words, interest rates can go to 100, it doesn't matter, because you're still gonna be paying, if you know. Now, one thing it does do is that if you have a house, you're not gonna move, right? Because, the, and this was already happening. Okay, so that's, that's number one. Number two, affordability of housing at this rate. The, the, if you're a new home buyer, you can't buy a house. You can't afford a house. Let me just give you the, let me just give you the math. Uh, because I actually did do the math. So for the, uh, at this housing prices and this interest rates, uh, so in other words, the housing prices went up 35, 40% uh, from before the pandemic to today. Okay, and now they decline, start to decline. For at this interest rate, the housing prices have to decline close to 40 plus percent. From, I forget the number, from 420 to, to 60, okay? Wiping out most of the equity the average US household, uh, house owner has. And uh, for somebody to be able to afford the house, for the affordability to be at the same level what was pre-pandemic. What's also important about this is that, you know George Soros' reflexivity? how high asset prices lead to people buying, you know, spending more money, and that's what kind of Federal Reserve is hoping for. It also works the other way. If the housing prices decline, okay, people will start feeling less wealthy. And that in itself may prolong the recession. Again, I'm a stock picker, I'm not an economist. I'm just kind of giving you my, my thinking through this, and I'm sure there's somebody who has a PhD in economics behind the name would probably have a better answer, but I'm just kind of, Give, telling you how I'm thinking about it. And also I realize that economy is a very complex system. Okay, when, uh, I'll give you this very true story. I was at the CFA dinner in, in Denver. I think it was 2007 or 2008. And there was four of us sitting, you know, like, kind of like this. And there were a couple strategies from big, you know, big you know, investment firms in, in, uh, uh, from Wall Street. And they were trying to, you know, one was saying, well, we're gonna have a recession in three months. The other says, no, we're gonna have it in nine and a half months. And there was this debate going on. The irony of this, and, I, and I, my answer was, I don't know, which is a very typical answer for me because I really don't know. The irony is this, a year later we, earn, we learned that we were already six months in the recession while we had this conversation. That's how complex, complex economy is. Um, but you're right about another point. I think the financial system in the US today is a much stronger you know, uh, situation than it was 2008. So I'm not saying we're gonna have a 2008 kind of crisis. I'm just saying it's gonna be a recession. When you have so much excesses built up for such a long period of time, it takes, what recessions are, it's just basically our organism is trying to digest a lot of excesses. And we had plenty of time to create a lot of excesses. Our diets were good, I mean, they were not good, all these different things. And that's, you know, recession, I think it just takes longer for, to cure the excesses. So that's, you know, that's where I'm coming from. So I think I have a couple of questions here. Uh, I can ask them. So this one is by Anil Gilani. Uh, he's, in a way, challenging this hypothesis on 
active doing well in the coming decade because what if flows continue to uh, you know uh, keep trickling in and markets remain efficient and research coverage keeps getting deeper and deeper by all market participants how do we still make money okay so the, the there's this this okay so i'm a cfa so when I say these words, you just, you just want to know it comes from the place of love, okay? <laughs> when you start talking about efficient markets, okay, when, 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 you know, like, what world do you live in? You know, that Tesla stock just declined 65%. They say, was it trillion dollar company? Was it efficient that they, when its market cap was a trillion dollars? So anyway, so I just, so you just want you to know that this is from a place of love. Um, um, but the, I think what's happened over the last decade is basically this. What interest rates do, they create kind of financial gravity. They, they make market, you know, they, uh, they kind of, the right interest rates lead to kind of rational capital allocation. When interest rates decline to zero or negative, they create chaos. And the money starts flowing not to rational investments, but to to the one that's expected to make you the most amount of money today, or, I mean tomorrow. So when you had companies that were basically trading at 50 times revenues, uh, and you could justify that because interest rates were zero, so therefore, think about it, if interest rates are zero, the future is basically, or oh, especially if it's negative. If each, the, like, like the concept of negative interest rates is baffles me because you're basically saying, Companies more malleable ten years from now, at negative interest rates, the cash flows than it's than it's today. So I think over the last ten years we had so much mis uh, when interest rates were so much lower, so much capital misallocation that as interest rates come back to normal, the markets start to operate become actually a lot more efficient in the sense that more rational. Right. And I think this is this is why I'm very uh, very uh, bullish on active investing. I mean, I'm sorry, on the, yeah, most is passive, yeah. yeah. Uh, because I think the financial gravity, like the, the rationality will come back again. Sure. And I think on a more generic scale, I guess, uh, many investors who've been in this game for long enough do realize that there is always an inefficiency in the market. And if you ask me, if I were to summarize this, I would say this business is all about, you know, uh, the time arbitrage. Everything may look efficient at a point in time because you're baking in and discounting the news right today, but nobody wants to really look at the news from a three year or a five year perspective, which is where basically value investing can be very, very successful because you're trying to look at information, not from an immediate here and now basis, but over you know, the fullness of time. So in some sense, the delayed gratification versus the instant gratification is really what matters and therefore, you know, markets will offer you opportunities of inefficiency. Hey, let me add to this. One of the questions what you asked me was, uh, how do you remain rational when your clients have a time horizon of three months or six months? Well, if that hap but by the way, that in itself is an efficiency, right? So if you have a time horizon longer than six months, that actually gives you a competitive advantage. Exactly. That's, that's exactly. I have another interesting question here by Himanshu Dugar. He says, how do you identify pockets where valuation or multiple derating would be minimal? Minimal, And is this driven by sustainability of earnings or by the future growth strategy? So in a way, trying to figure out that in higher interest rate environments, perhaps everything will be derated. That's what you're saying. Multiples in S&P are still very high, so we would see a, a downward drift. But within this framework, uh, which could be the best ones? Yeah, so I think the, it's a, you want to look at this as a multivariable equation, okay? And um, some, like you have, uh, in my first book, Active Value Investing, I went through this whole exercise of doing this. But when you have two different companies of different qualities, if you have a, like an example I used at the time, Kmart and Walmart, okay? Kmart is out of business sense, that tells you a lot. But should Walmart be, you know, let's say everything is the same, growth, you know, earnings growth, et cetera, is the same, but would you pay higher multiple for Walmart than for Kmart? Yes, right? So now, if you have another company that's growing earnings at a faster rate than the other, should you be paying higher multiple for the higher growing company? Yes. So the way I look at it, we, when we analyze companies, we look at, you know, we look at quality, we look at growth, and uh, 
the, we look at the recurrence of revenue, that's actually comes back to, uh, uh, to quality. We look at the balance sheet, we look at management. All these different factors, if we identify it as a high quality company, it should trade in general at a higher valuation than a low quality company. Now, now uh, and uh, so what we actually do is kind of turn a lot of rocks and try to find high quality companies. And then we still want margin of safety because if we are, if we get the valuation wrong, okay, and, but we bought it cheap enough, we're still gonna come out okay. So I think you wanna have a significant margin of safety. And uh, there was a famous ba uh, a bank robber. He, he was asked, uh, why is he robbing banks? He said, well, because that's where the money is. <laughs> so, when, so how you identify, you know, uh, you know how, how those, those companies find, you know, undervalued companies find our portfolio, we just keep looking for cheapness. We look, keep looking for undervaluation just in different places. Sure. There's a very interesting question by Sudhir, Sudhir Suyog. And this is one question, at least I get asked whenever I meet my overseas investors. Uh, and you know, it's like the man with the hammer syndrome. I really don't have a very strong answer. And the question is that, uh, what do you think are the key concerns to the India growth story or to the India story per se? I think the bureaucracy. I think the, uh, I, have a, I have an American Indian friend who spent uh, who got inheritance 11 months ago, and he's been living in India for 11 months just to get his inheritance. You know, he's going through the courts. So uh, uh, I think those, the, the, the two really, infrastructure and, and kind of bureaucracy. Again, I'm, I'm, I've, been, I've, been, I've been here for eight days, so I, I would discount everything I have to say about India from this perspective. But this is what I encountered. Uh, sure. You know, uh, you're absolutely right, but the fact also is that my typical pushback to this question is that notwithstanding this bureaucracy, over the last 30 years, we've still grown at 6.5%. Perhaps what you're saying is that to continue growing at 6.5% real GDP growth, we need to get more productive and therefore have you know, less bureaucracy and uh, much more efficient systems. I was telling my daughter, next time she'll be here, it's going to be a very different country. Like, and, I, and, I, and I think, and I, and I truly believe this, and I think there is one thing that's going for India, which is tremendous, is uh, selective deglobalization. The, the West basically realized that China is not our friend, and Russia is not our friend. And you, you're gonna start seeing a lot more manufacturing and other jobs moving away from China to other countries. Mexico will benefit from this. Uh, I think India will benefit from it tremendously. Sure. So it's the, your gain to lose, basically. Sure. I think we have time for just one last question from here. Uh, you know, uh, this one is from Vikrant, and he's trying to be very, very specific with you. Uh, he's trying to figure out, tell me the businesses or the sectors uh, where you're bullish on. Like if we talked like a year and a half ago, I would have told you, and I wrote about this, I would, I would have said uh, defense companies at the time, uh, because that sector at the time was very cheap. Today, uh, I can't really point on one sector in general, but let me tell you what we're looking for in the companies we're buying, okay? And we have these three filters. Um, well, those who read my books will I didn't, you know, see those filters very quickly. Quality, volume, growth, but quality, that, that's, that's what I want to focus on. Um, quality filter, we have these three buckets. Great business, high quality business. What does quality mean, really? Warren Buffett has the best definition, and this is the kind of this is the question I keep asking every time I look at this business, at other business. If the stock market was closed for ten years, would you want to still be in this business? Remember, ten years you could have recessions, depressions, whatever. Would you still be comfortable being in this owning this business if you could not sell it for ten years? That is what quality means to me. Like that's a that's what competitive advantage means, right? But also, um, like also, high recurrence of revenues, very you know very important to us. A high return capital, all those characteristics of a quality business. Now, another thing is uh, oh, and then of course balance sheet, and I think balance sheet is a, it's very tricky um, because during the inflationary environment, 
you actually have to look at capital expenditures more closely. I'll give you, I'll, constru I'll, I'll uh, talk about two different businesses and you can see how inflation impacts them differently. If you look at railroads, they have a uh, very high maintenance capital expenditures because as train go through trucks, they beat them up, okay? So the trucks that uh, you built 30 years ago, if you were to replace them, the costs are gonna be higher. Now, if, so, so, when you look, so the maintenance capital expenditures for railroads are very, very high in relation to cash flows. Now, if you look at pipelines, okay? Pipelines, you know, the fluid does not destroy pipelines as much as, uh, as, as very heavy trains. So the maintenance capital, maintenance capital expenditures for pipelines are a very, very small number. Mm -hmm. So even if interest rates go up, and they, you know, this, 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 both businesses use a lot of debt, the capital expenditures on pipelines are going to be much small, much smaller number, and therefore inflation is going to impact them a lot less. Right. Okay. So those are kind of uh, nuances from inflation. But anyway, the, uh, the, po the point I wanted to make here is this. Uh, Another thing I learned to appreciate, and this took me a long time to appreciate, is the value of management. Okay, when we analyze management, uh, because it's really, if you think about companies, it's really how much people come into work and, and doing their best every day, okay? And when we look at management, we analyze them from two perspectives. How well they are at running the business and how, and how well they allocate capital. Two different skill sets. And what you find the people, a lot of times, a lot of times management team, teams have one skill but not the other. So we, when we analyze you know, management, we look at both skills. And, um, and finally, even though kind of I'm a value investor and uh, uh, growth is not supposed to be kind of even mentioned by me, but I think there is a lot of value in growth. Yep. If you find a company that can increase its earnings over a long period of time, there is value in that. So, uh, so I would love, I would, you know, one of, the, one of the questions you had was there's a lot of stocks, there are you know, growth stocks that have declined a, a bunch. Right. I would love to own a lot of them just at the right price. Right. And I think a lot of these companies, and this starts, you know, and, I, and I've been saying it before it started to happen, a lot of these companies are going to go through cost cutting and rationalization. I mean, Google announced today the uh, layoff of 12,000 people. So the cost structure of these businesses got overly, overly inflated. I mean, if you look at Twitter, Twitter is to me is a very interesting uh, case study because Elon Musk laid off three quarters of employees and it seems to be working just fine. <laughs> and they seem to be coming out with new products. Now, if you're working for Google and you're, think and you're running Google, you're thinking, so if we get rid of three quarters of our employees, we're still gonna be fine? I mean, maybe that's an extreme, but a lot of Silicon Valley companies are now thinking, thinking yeah. like that. So anyway, so I would love to, the that uh, comes 2.0 that you have know, been bumped out over the last uh, six six months a year. I would love to buy those companies at some point at the right price. So. Sure, great. Well, I think that's uh, all the time that we had for this session. Thank you, Italy, for patiently taking all the questions uh, and telling us about the two books that you have written. Uh, and a big round of applause once again for Italy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.